So in this next section of shelling, uh, section four, inhibition and stages of development, uh, the problem becomes, the problem arises to specify how nature could inhibit its product at particular stages of development without ceasing to be active itself. And at this point, uh, shelling is going to get into uh, the whole problem of the division into sexes at the organic level. Now, the whole philosophy is based on this idea that nature is originally self-identical with itself, the absolute, like the Fichtean ego, which is originally begins by being A is A, A is self-identical with itself, and that uh, self-reverting feedback loop is then interrupted by the positing of a not-self. So too with nature, the absolute is originally uh, infinitely self-identical with itself, but then posits an antithesis, antithetical forces that act as points of inhibition. And originally, as we've seen, these points of inhibition are ideal points of in inhibition that Schelling calls actants. The actants are basically, another word that he uses for them in another paper is entelechies. They're basically entelechies. They're actants, they're points of inhibition. Uh, and the inhibition is a counterforce that moves against the initial force of nature that then enables it to start bringing form into being. So at every level of morphogenesis in nature for Schelling, uh, there is a strife between duality. Uh, so there are dual forces at every level. At the first basic level, what he calls the, the first power or the first potency, mass or matter is produced through the repulsive force that pushes from a center outward and the attractive force that acts upon it as, as, an, as a point of inhibition that checks it and brings matter into being. Then at the second potency, uh, the same types of forces are involved in the production of magnetism first, then electricity and electricity of the positive and negative charges. Uh, and then in chemistry as well, as the third, at, at the level of the second potency. Then at the third potency, the third potency is the organic level itself, the, the realm of living forms. Um, and there are three levels there which have to do with sensibility, irritability or excitability, and reproduction or reproducibility. And it's the reproducibility aspect that he's jumping ahead to here at this point that he's concerned with to show how nature, uh, when it produces living forms, does so through the point of inhibition represented by the division of the formative drive into pairs of opposites, sexual opposites. Uh, but he says that it, it does this, it only produces uh, the differentiation into sexual opposites at certain stages of development. Um, for example, he gives the example of the butterfly. The pupa uh, for the butterfly is essentially sexually indeterminate. It's neither male nor female until it goes through the process of cocooning itself and then appearing as a butterfly. When it appears as a butterfly, now it's sexually formed. It's at the zenith or apogee of its development. The sex organs have appeared, and it appears to be that the production of the sexual uh, differentiation is the prime, has been the primary goal all along because this is the azimuth of its de development, the highest point, the apogee of its development. And it's also paradoxically the point at which the individual is most pronounced. The beauty of the butterfly with all of its colors, certain beautiful flowers at their respective stages of development, uh, we see that the beauty of the of the matured adult form appears as the flashing forth of its greatest individuality at precisely the point where the sex organs appears. And at that point, it is no longer the object of nature, of, of what he calls pure productivity, but now it becomes the means or the instrument towards something else. And of course, this towards something else is that with the production of the sexual differentiation, uh, nature, which is hostile to the individual and basically seeks to annihilate it, now wants to seek to use the individual to continue to produce the genus. To And the genus itself, for uh, Schelling, is the uh, uh, production or the mirroring of the original self-identity, the original absolute self-identity of nature. Uh, that's what it's always trying to get back to, that original fundamental self-identity, so that everything that is produced in nature uh, is a kind of mirror of the absolute or an attempt to manifest or concretize the absolute uh, as though the absolute spirit were constantly trying to send out these little mini avatars of itself all through nature and incarnate them in material substrates. But it uses sexuality in nature uh, to do this and to appear at a certain stage. And once it appears at that stage, we have the highest stage of development. And also, paradoxically, the, state, the point of highest individuality. But nature isn't interested in the individual so much, or it becomes, it loses or begins to abandon the individual at that point where the individual is produced, and then it uses the individual to replicate the genus and to reproduce the genus itself to infinity. 
So its development stops at that point. It no longer continues to development. It simply seeks at that point to reproduce itself in its ideal sense to infinity. Differentiation stops, but the activity doesn't cease. So the point of inhibition that solves his problem here is precisely sexual differentiation on the organic level, uh, but it, the, the activity doesn't cease because it uses the individual then to reproduce, to reproduce the species. And the species really is all that matters as far as nature is concerned. And he says that the, the, the higher up you go in nature, the more individuality, the more sexual, in the, uh, the more independent the sexes become of each other. Uh, the higher up till you get in the human world, they, they become uh, the most independent of each other. Because in the lower forms of nature, once sexuality is produced, once the organism reproduces, it simply dies. The flower wilts the moment it reproduces. Uh, you know, the, the fable about the, the black widow that reproduces and then kills the male. The individual is simply done away with in lower forms of nature the moment that it reproduces sexually. But in higher forms, as you move up the gradation, the sexes become independent and there's a much slower attenuation. Uh, after the attainment of sexual maturity, uh, it is still the case that nature uh, is willing to annihilate and dispense with the individual, but it does so at a much more slow, uh, at a much slower rate, I suppose, thankfully for us at the level of, at this higher level of, of uh, species differentiation uh, at, at the top of the food chain, as it were. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing, too, that, that Schelling talks about in this chapter, and it really is a chapter in which you, he's already anticipating certain of Darwin's insights. They're on the way here, but they're done in German fashion. And uh, the Germans, of course, as with, with Goethe and, and other philosophers, had already figured out evolution, basically. They, they already had the idea, but they always put the emphasis, and this is the same in German idealist thought, whether in German biology, the emphasis is always on the internal creative form and a force to drive, which is free and creative, not on the external environment. In the Anglo tradition, the creative force becomes mechanical. It becomes mechanized in Darwin to natural selection, which is simply external pressure on the environment that is merely an editing function. It's not creative at all. It simply puts exertive pressure on those mutations that have been produced randomly, spontaneously, and randomly for Darwin. Uh, and those ones are selected out, which will best fit the organism to survive and propagate its genes. But that's a mechanical version of the German version, which is that... Um, According to Schelling in this chapter, uh, he has a theory that he's calling genes germs, basically. There, there are these original actants that are there in the first example of each species. The primal individual contains all of the original actants within it that are already there as predispositions within the species. And external nature can put pressure on them and, and pull them out or cause them to uh, cause certain actants to become dominant while other actants become subordinate. Uh, but that's a process that happens uh, later on. In, in, but, but there's a kind of species preformationism here, in other words, is what I'm getting at, which is interesting because Schelling denies the theory of individual preformationism. He denies, for example, that everything that happens in the butterfly, that for every structure that appears, there's a little miniature version of it present in the caterpillar, which had been one of the main theories uh, put forth for to explain embryogenesis, that the embryo is simply an inflated balloon-like version of little tiny structures that were already there to begin with. And Shelley says, no, that isn't the case. Uh, evolution unfolds through epigenesis in which you get more form from less. Um, and there are structural modification, basically what he calls metamorphosis, which is inherited from Goethe here. And metamorphosis is a complete structural transformation of the individual. But in the species, with regard to the genera, there, he does admit a kind of uh, generic preformationism insofar as only certain species are going to produce those characteristics that were already there in the original primal ur individuals, the first examples of these new species to begin with. Um, <clears throat> so fixity of species is only apparent uh, in nature. It's, it's only something that appears to be the case, but it isn't, it isn't the case. Nature is constantly changing, transforming, producing new species, is what he calls uh, new spheres of formation. A sphere of formation is a variety within a species, like different races, in the human species, these are different spheres of formation that the formative drive, the internal formative drive, is constantly producing. Later, this will become uh, the German biologist Hugo de Vries will put forth the theory of mutation in which it's mutation, not natural selection, that's the primary creative force, and mutation isn't random. This is where uh, the German tradition differs from Darwin, just as uh, the German philosophical tradition puts all the emphasis on the freedom 
of the spontaneity, the internal free acts of the individual acting ego. The freedom and spontaneity are fundamental and creative. The individual is not determined by necessity. Necessity is only apparent in the outer world. The fundamental causal zones come from within the individual. Same thing in their theory, their, the German idealist version of evolution here. The creative force, uh, which Schelling is calling the formative drive, is something that is inherent and creative, and it's there uh, in the organism uh, and differentiates itself. The external pressures can pull out certain selective variations uh, that produce these new spheres of formation, uh, but the emphasis is on the creativity of the internal drive of the organism. And he also says that all the organisms in nature are essentially a single er animal, a single giant organism that through different uh, levels of gradation has stopped at each level of gradation and another organism is invented to carry on and pick up where the previous organism left off so that everything is a single continuous giant animal organism that is unfolding, the absolute spirit unfolding itself uh, like as though it were the case that each, that each species or each organism were uh, a single organ of a single animal. So this is a good old-fashioned metaphysical German 19th century, now discredited romantic biology, which is fascinating because it's, I think it's more closer to poetry and visionary insight uh, and the great epic traditions than it is science. Uh, the reason you know, people don't read Schelling anymore is precisely because of this kind of creative version of science. But see, this is philosophy. This isn't, this isn't science. And philosophy, uh, it's a mistake to believe that philosophy should behave in accordance with the same strictures as the sciences. The sciences are about extracting information from the world. As Schelling says in another essay, uh, the scientist inserts into the world an experiment that extracts information from the world that he already expects to find. Uh, a priori, the experiment is simply a confirmation of what he already expects to find. And science is, is about extracting information from the world, but philosophy isn't. It's about creative visions of the world. Uh, as Deleuze puts it, the philosopher is the one who creates concepts. Concepts are created as tools to create new cosmological visions of the world, exactly like the poet and the artist are doing, except that the tools that the artist or that the philosopher uses are, are concepts rather than colors, let's say, or his palette is the, the ontology of the concepts that he invents. And I think Schelling is very creative here. All these German idealist philosophers are very creative in the way that they paint nature as inherently creative and spontaneous and active and a manifestation of the absolute spirit. And this makes their vision of the world, I think, consistent with that of the perennial philosophy of the great mystical traditions, which sees everything in the world as a non-accidental production of a spiritual dimension that is producing the phenomenal forms uh, as a way of realizing or unfolding its own inner potentiality, striving to reach higher and higher levels of consciousness. And, of course, Bergson and creative evolution will inherit this tradition from the Germans and continue it on in, into French philosophy where we will find its most recent statement in Deleuze, of course. Uh, so we'll stop there for that section and move on to section five next.